All right, one of my favorite lectures to give is on the 2008 housing crisis, and it's for a variety of reasons. One is it can be incredibly complex, but when you boil it down, it actually is rather simple. Um, second, it's important to understand how these things take place uh, so that we could potentially identify some of the possible issues in the future that might lead to a similar crisis. So we're going to be walking through the 2008 financial crisis here in hopefully a pretty simple way. So to start us off, we've got a couple of people involved in this process, as you can see. Uh, so I'm going to go ahead and kind of identify who these are. So this house looking drawing here, this is my best drawing of a house. This is going to be a homeowner. As we know, people want to own homes for a variety of reasons. Uh, the perception it's the American dream and building uh, assets and all those sorts of things. Uh, the next party that we have, this uh, is going to be the lender. And so this is the party that is going to be lending out uh, money to the homeowner. Uh, over here, we have what we call an investment bank. Uh, so if you're familiar with investment banks, uh, these are the institutions that help uh, create securities. Uh, they also help to uh, private companies go through initial public offerings uh, and all these sorts of things. But in the lens that we are looking through investment banks, their primary purpose is going to be creating securities. And that's a big thing that happened in 2008 and even before then um, is the fact that securities were created. Uh, so let's kind of walk through the basic process of how this takes place or how it's supposed to take place. And this should be uh, fairly uh, simple for the most part, uh, but we're going to build on it and add a couple of new wrinkles. So first, when somebody is in the market for a home, they typically get connected to a realtor of some kind and they go house shopping. Uh, at some point, they're going to put an offer in for a home to purchase it. Generally speaking, most people, though, don't have the cash on hand to just purchase the house outright. So they ultimately get connected to the lender. Now, the lender here serves a pretty important purpose um, in that they provide the homeowner with access to capital. Uh, and so this is really how the process will function normally. Um, ultimately, the homeowner is going to provide uh, a series of payments and then the lender is going to provide uh, the homeowner with a mortgage. And typically this works really well. So the homeowner every month will pay their mortgage, which includes principal payments. It also includes any interest and taxes and things like that. Uh, and in return, the homeowner gets to purchase the home and they wouldn't be able to do that ordinarily. Um, so this is the normal process here. Uh, typically, the lender will keep the mortgage for 15, 20, or 30 years, and then obviously will go ahead and um, relinquish the title or the deed to the home when the mortgage is fulfilled. Pretty simple. So at this point in time, now we're talking about 1999 to 2001, there's a couple of things that were going on that were pretty relevant uh, and ultimately affected um, it's kind of some of the things that were happening here. Um, one of those things, too, is there were a couple of notable events. And so the first of those uh, was the dot-com bubble. And so that involved tech companies that had these enormous valuations simply because they were using the internet to provide goods and services. Uh, but the reality was is the financials weren't very solid. These were companies that didn't have a great deal of revenue and couldn't justify the valuations. Uh, and so once the markets began to figure this out, um, any company that was connected to tech was was deemed to be unworthy. Uh, and you had all of this, uh, all these companies begin to fail because they couldn't have access to liquidity because the markets froze up at that point. Point. No one wanted to lend to a tech company. So that was one thing. Uh, the next thing that happened was 9-11. Result, anytime there's a terrorist attack, there is uncertainty in markets and that can cause some issues with regards to stock market fluctuations and people's willingness to extend credit and, and all those sorts of things. So in response to that, the Federal Reserve wanted to provide accommodative monetary policy. And so what the Fed did was it actually held down long-term interest rates to about 1%. Now, this is important for a variety of reasons. The first thing is the reason the Fed did this is it wanted to increase borrowing. And so it felt that if you lent money to banks for 1%, that would give them the incentive to take out those loans and then to, or take that money out and then lend it to homeowners or whoever or businesses for investment to get a better return. 
And so by holding down these rates, it's trying to facilitate borrowing and spending, right? And our economy is very dependent on spending, um, which in turn creates income for somebody else. And it really is what helps the economy continue to function normally. When markets stop working, meaning people stop lending money, uh, that really kind of affects the ability for transactions to take place. That affects markets, ultimately affects the economy. And then you can see how this spirals out of control. Now, the issue here isn't the 1%. It's what the impact is because this 1% percent also affects people's ability to get some kind of return. So now if you had a savings account, right, the amount of money you can earn in your savings account was very limited. Um, also, the amount of money that you can get in kind of fixed assets, fixed income assets was pretty slow or pretty low. This encouraged people to, uh, let's say, take riskier bets. So because interest rates are so low, I can't get a really good return on a normal bond, let's say. So, and I need to get a pretty decent return, especially if I'm on fixed income. Uh, so instead, I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to look for something riskier, which is going to be things like stocks. Now, back to our example, investment banks were also concerned about this because they couldn't get the return that they needed either. So they had an idea and that idea was to go ahead and contact the lenders. And so what they wanted to do is they wanted to acquire mortgages. So essentially the lender would sell off the mortgage to the investment bank and the investment bank would now own that asset. The lender would collect a, a, a fee uh, simply for kind of originating the loan and then obviously any interest they earned to that point. Um, but it was great for the lender because they can make really quick money um, by simply originating loans and then selling them off and going through this transaction hundreds of thousands of times and generating some pretty decent decent fees. And so that was kind of how it worked. What the investment banks then decided to do was to turn these mortgages into securities. Uh, and so what they would do is they would basically take all of the securities and they would throw all those securities into a box and then they would allow people to invest in that security. So as long as homeowners are making payments on their investments or on their mortgages, then this security continues to do well and continues to go up in value. And that provides a little bit of a benefit. Uh, and so these were called mortgage-backed securities. It's probably a term that you actually heard before. At this point, everything is going well, right? So assuming that the homeowner continues to make their payments, which is great, the lender will originate the loan, sell it off to the investment bank, assuming that the homeowner continues to make payments on said loan, securities are always rising. And here's the thing. If the homeowner defaults and decides not to pay, the bank takes control or the investment bank takes control of the mortgage because it's an asset-backed mortgage. So ultimately the collateral is the house. So if you stop paying, investment bank takes out, takes the house, and then they can just sell it because there's a common, uh, let's say, theme during this time. And that was the perception that homes always increase in value. So because of that, then I'm not really worried if anybody defaults because somebody does, then I'll sell it and I'll be able to make more money and then I'll continue to turn that into a security and it's no problem. So the issue comes up in that eventually at some point we ran out of homeowners. There was nobody left. Everyone who was considered to be a prime buyer had a mortgage. So a prime buyer is characterized by a couple of different things, right? So first off, prime buyers have good credit have very low debt to income ratio uh, and typically have stable employment. And if you've ever applied for a home, you'll notice that, you know, the mortgage originator, usually the lender, um, checks your credit, checks how much debt you have, kind of analyzes your ability to pay. So prime buyers are those that have a pretty decent likelihood of being able to pay. So the problem here is that we run out of those people. Everybody that wants a home that is a prime buyer essentially has a home. And so um, this is very bad for the investment banking community and the lenders, frankly, uh, because they still want to sell these mortgage-backed securities. So they have an idea. Well, let's go ahead and let's forget the prime buyers and let's move on and let's sell to subprime buyers. Now, a subprime buyer is 
basically the exact opposite of a prime buyer. Uh, so they typically will have poor credit scores. So there's usually some delinquencies or overdue uh, past due payments that are affecting their score. Uh, they might have very high debt to income, so they already have outstanding debts, uh, and they might have unstable employment. They might have contract work. They might be unemployed. They don't have a very good, uh, let's say, documentation of ability to pay. But here's the thing about this whole process is that, again, the perception at this point in time is that homes always increase in value. So even if a sub subprime buyer defaulted, you could just sell the house, right? So this process then goes through the same exact cycle. So homeowners get connected to lenders, lenders sell the investment to investment banks, and investment banks create mortgage-backed securities. Now, if you're thinking about at this part, part by thinking about, well, why would the lender do that? Well, we have to think about incentives. Ultimately, the lender is going to collect their fee simply for selling off the home. So they're not really going to hold it as an asset for any period of time. So lenders really don't care. And so what happened is lenders started to reduce the restrictions or reduce the requirements to get a loan. In many cases, not requiring any documentation because ultimately that loan was going to go to the investment bank and it was going to be off their books. It wasn't their problem. They would collect the fee. The investment banks then obviously packaged them and wanted to turn them into this mortgage-backed security. So the problem, though, is mortgage-backed securities are rated, rated by credit rating agencies. And so a credit rating agency includes companies like Moody's, SMP, and Fitch. SMP standing for Standard & Poor's. So these entities are, des are designated with evaluating the... Uh, merit of a particular security and they stamp it with a grade. They literally grade it much like you get grades in college and in school. Uh, and so co common grades, like the best one is uh, AAA rated. Uh, and this is considered to be investment grade. There's double A and then there's single A and then you get to triple B, double B, you get the point. So this is important because if, if in a security is what's called an investment grade, meaning it is considered to be something worthy of investment, it's not junk, then this allows entities called institutional investors to invest. So institutional investors include big companies like pension funds, mutual funds, uh, and, and insurance companies, right? They command a lot of money. It's talking about billions and billions of dollars. So if I'm going to sell a security, I want to sell it to the people that can buy billions of dollars with it, right? Well, the problem is if I sell these subprime mortgage-backed securities, they're going to be rated really low. So I have an idea and here's my idea. So I have my normal box that's filled with different securities. What I do is I separate that box into what we call tranches. And so each box has a certain type of security that I can choose to invest in. So what happens is this box has three different types of securities. So just as a basic example, we can say this first box is all of our AAA. These are our prime mortgage-backed security. So all of the securities in this bond or in this tranche, if you will, are AAA rated. They're um, good credit scores, low debt to income. Chances are they're going to pay. In this middle tranche here, I'm going to include maybe my B. And so this could be people that maybe they've got a mark on their credit. They're not terrible, um, but there's something in their past that is making it a little bit less of a certainty that they're going to pay it back. More often than not, they will, but they're still going to potentially default. And then the last tranche here, the very, very bottom, this is our uh, what we call junk, which is sub-investment grade. So this is where we get the subprime mortgages. And so these ones are probably going to default, but we've got all of these other tranches here that are going to prop up the whole thing. We call this nice little uh, financial uh, investment that was newly created a CDO, which stands for a collateralized debt obligation. Now, the thing with CDOs is when I package them up, they simply look like this. 
one box with three different tranches, three different separations. Now, this might not seem important on the surface, but it is from a rating agency standpoint because there's a couple of good securities in there. And so the credit rating agencies will give this a triple A rating, even though there's not investment grade material. I mean, there's a lot of junk securities in here. They'll give it a triple A rating. Now, you're probably asking, well, why would a credit rating agency do this? Well, it goes back to incentives again, right? If I go first over to, let's say, Moody's and I give them my basket of securities and I say, I want you to rate these and I would like an investment grade rating. And they look at them and they see the underlying assets and they see that there's a lot of bad stuff in here. They're going to turn me down. Well, then all I'm going to do is I'm going to go to SMP. And if SMP turns me down, I'm going to go to Fitch. So Moody's knows this, right? They understand the dynamics and there are other players involved. And so they feel pressured to provide a AAA rating to this entire CDO simply because they don't want to lose out, lose out on business. And there are fees that are collected from rating these securities. So they collect a fee for doing so. And if all of a sudden Goldman Sachs comes in and wants to have a bunch of materials rated and Moody says, well, we would rate these as junk, then Goldman Sachs is going to take their entire portfolio of business over to SMP. And Moody certainly doesn't want that because they have investors and, and stockholders to appease. And ultimately, they want to be able to run a, a profitable business. And so that creates an issue where I have a AAA rated security that is not actually AAA. It's not actually filled with good stuff. So as you can see, this entire dynamic here is built on one assumption, and that is that houses are always going to increase in value. Well, eventually at some point, houses stop going up, right? Uh, and so not even decrease in value, but they just don't go up as quickly as they have before. What happens now is you have homeowners who had adjustable rate mortgages. And these rates, as rates are changing and as home values go up, they can't refinance their home to pull out enough equity to continue to you know, pay down the loan and they can't get another loan on that. Uh, and so they start to default. And so this bottom tranche here, this gets eliminated. So there's no longer any money flowing into the mortgage-backed security. Not a big deal. Investment bank owns the home, so they can always try and sell it. Well, then the triple at B goes out as well. They stop paying. And then the AAA, not entirely, but a lot of people stop paying. They intentionally foreclose because they look around and they see that the value of my home that I bought for 600000 is now worth 250000 and I don't want a $250,000 asset. So I choose to walk away. Ultimately, this causes a huge ripple effect in the economy. Because now homes are going down in value. And ultimately, who's holding these AAA bonds? Well, a lot of the investment banks. So you've got pension funds. People have their retirement, are now exposed to this and are losing out a lot of money. You've got insurance companies that are losing out. And then you have mutual funds. Keep in mind that many individual investors like you and I who save for retirement own a great deal of mutual funds, probably in our 401k or IRA. And so you see the impact of that. You see the impact of people's pensions. You see insurance companies as well. All of this causes a complete reversal of credit going from where credit was flowing freely to now ultimately where people aren't lending money. Uh, and you get to the point to where now you have investment banks starting to fail, most notably Lehman Brothers on September 15th of 2008. And that's when the catastrophe really does get worse, at least from a public perception standpoint. So that in a maybe not so short way is a little bit about how the 2008 financial crisis took place. Ultimately, there wasn't one factor involved, but a cacophony of different factors, including low interest rates, including market perception that homes are always going to go up in value, and then a little bit of greed as well, right? On the homeowner's part, wanting to own a home, maybe even when we financially can't afford it, but somebody like a realtor or a lender is saying we can, and then ultimately on the investment banks, creating all of these different securities, including CDOs linked to mortgages, and then presenting such more such securities as being greater in value than they really were, 
thus deceiving investors and thus creating a huge issue throughout our economy.